Welcome to this evening's program, Science and Cinema New Screen Frontiers. My name is Bob Chris. I'm a, a partner with the law firm of Mayor Brown in Chicago, and I'm also a member of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. We refer to ourselves sometimes as C2ST, and we are one of the sponsors of this evening's program. Uh, a few words about C2ST. We are a not-for-profit organization dedicated to increasing people's understanding and appreciation of science and technology. It's our hope that if people know more about science, they'll make better decisions at the ballot box, they'll make better decisions with their careers, and they'll have a happier life because in this ever-changing world, uh, it helps to understand what's happening in order to be comfortable with what's happening, and science is a big part of all of that. Uh, the, our board is comprised of representatives from all of the major universities and museums in Chicago. Uh, we have representatives from the city of Chicago and a number of businesses uh, in the Chicago area. Uh, we have uh, been producing programs over the last several years in a wide variety of subjects, uh, such as uh, Alzheimer's research and treatment, uh, cybersecurity, uh, gene patenting, uh, uh, physics of baseball, we had a program of physics of baseball at White Sox Park. Uh, so a very wide range of uh, subjects that we have handled over the last several years. Tonight is our 100th program. So it's uh, kind, of a, kind of a milestone. And it is the kickoff of a new initiative to promote collaboration between scientists and filmmakers. I think that most of the people in this room would agree that movies can make a difference. The movies have changed people's attitudes towards race and gender issues. Uh, they have allowed people to better understand their world. They've stimulated social and political reforms. Movies are perhaps the most par powerful storytelling mechanism in the current time. Well, C2ST would like to see more science in the movies. We'd like to harness the power of the cinema to persuade people that science and technology are so critically important to addressing the challenges that we are confronting today and that we're going to confront tomorrow. Uh, I've mentioned to a couple people during the uh, reception period, uh, my personal goal when I think about this, uh, I think about it in terms of trying to move science and technology into the mainstream to the point where people will be as interested in hearing about a scientific breakthrough as they are about the Chicago Bulls or Chicago Bears scores. I mean, that's what we're ultimately looking for. <laughs> and it's our view that there are few things more powerful than movies to help you know, make that happen. So, a little bit of background as to how, how all this happened. Uh, several months ago, uh, we were having a programming meeting, a uh, meeting of our programming committee of C2ST, and we got to thinking, you know, we have a very, very strong filmmaking community in Chicago. We have world-leading uh, institutions of science and technology here, and we have uh, one of the most well-respected international film festivals. So we had three pieces of a puzzle, and when you mix metaphors here, you connect the dots, uh, or the puzzles fall in place, or whatever you want to say. Uh, it seemed to us that if we could uh, uh, start a film competition under the auspices of the uh, International Film Festival here, and then follow through and help organize networking uh, uh, meetings like this one, perhaps some online mechanisms. We're gonna talk about that later in, in the program, some brainstorming about how we keep this momentum going, uh, that we really have something, you know, something that would uh, you know, ignite a lot of creative energy and produce some really, really fine movies in the Chicago area, and internationally, because this is, in fact, the, uh, the International Film Festival. So, uh, Mimi Plache, who you'll hear from in a few moments, she uh, joined our think tank and uh, was a very important person in that think tank because when she said yes, she might consider uh, being part of this, then the light really went on and we thought, boy, we, you know, we really had something that we could shoot for. It gave us a structure, it gave us a goal. 
And so many, many thanks to Mimi, and as I say, you'll hear from her in a few moments. Let me just give you a very brief overview of what will happen tonight uh, after I'm finished, and I'll be finished soon. Uh, Mimi will speak uh, to you about the International Film Festival and how it intends to uh, foster science filmmaking. Uh, then we will have a um, panel set of a series of three panel discussions that concern three different award-winning science films. And we're going to hear from the filmmakers, and we're going to hear, hear from some of the sci scientists who are advisors to those films, and we're going to hear from some of the other some other scientists who are interested in the process of filmmaking. And they're going to talk about uh, their experience collaborating uh, together and also the impact that they think that science films can have on our society. Uh, Nick Davis, a professor of English from Northwestern University, uh, who specializes in film, is going to be the moderator of that, program, of that panel discussion. After the panel discussion, we'll take questions and answers, uh, questions from the audience. We'll give answers if we can. Uh, and then we'll have a, br a brainstorming session. Uh, we want to hear from you, both the scientific community and the uh, filmmaking community, what you think would be helpful in keeping the momentum going. Uh, how can we facilitate you know, meaningful collaborations, get people to meet each other and brainstorm and, and make some really fine movies. So before we get started, I'd like to specially thank again Mimi, uh, tremendously important in this effort. Uh, I'd like to uh, also thank Lisa Lavalli, Director of Communications for the Office of the Vice President for Research and for National Laboratories at the University of Chicago for her exceptional work in developing, organizing, and publicizing the program. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, she and I were the germ of the idea, and I don't know what I would have done without Lisa, because uh, you know she really knows how to implement these things. Lisa, would you take a, would you stand? At the moment? <laughs> I didn't mention Mimi because Mimi's going to be standing here in a moment. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Bruce Sheridan. He is the chair of Cinema Art and Science at Columbia College. And um, uh, Bruce was uh, invaluable. I mean, he was a man, an idea a minute. Uh, but a lot of folks who have uh, lots of ideas, it only goes that far. It doesn't get implemented. But Bruce, he implements. I mean, it was amazing the, the uh, doors that he opened and, and the amount of time and energy he spent to make this happen. You'll, you'll be hearing from Bruce later in the program today. And also, I would like to thank uh, Andrea Poet of C2ST, uh, whose tireless efforts in organizing and publicizing this event uh, were invaluable. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we have formed an exciting partnership, C2ST, with the Chicago International Film Festival and Columbia College. This is an ongoing commitment. Uh, this is not a one-night uh, one one stand. Uh, th this, is, this is really a commitment. Uh, and it's just the beginning of a great conversation that we hope to have over the next several months as to how we can bring scientists and filmmakers together to make some really powerful movies uh, and uh, you know, move the cultural needle a little bit in the right direction. Thank you very much. Mimi? Thank you so much, Bob. And I'd like to extend a very special thank you to Columbia College Chicago for hosting us in this beautiful space. So it's my pleasure to be here tonight for this event that is launching a new partnership and initiative around science and film in Chicago. So the Chicago International Film Festival has a very long and rewarding relationship with Columbia College Chicago that goes back now for more than 20 years. And we're always looking for new and exciting projects to enhance our collaboration. So when C2ST approached us about getting involved in a science and film project, which is actually something we've been interested at the festival in for several years now, knowing that Columbia College would also be involved made it all the more appealing. This is the 100th program for C2ST, but this is the 50th anniversary of the Chicago International Film Festival. So. 
A little bit about the festival is we're the longest running competitive international film festival in North America. And we have a long history of showcasing both the best in international cinema, but one of our priorities is also to foster filmmaking in Chicago, which is something that we've been working toward in recent years. Um, we also have a long history of showcasing work that brings together both the art of filmmaking, both for the small and the large screen, and science. So since the very beginning of the festival, we've had a competition called Intercom, which has awarded top science films made in educational, corporate, and industrial contexts. But more recently, uh, we have a couple of filmmakers here that have won awards in the festival with their science films, which I think demonstrates our commitment to showing films about science. So in 2007, Maria Finitza's Terra Incognita was in our documentary competition and won the Chicago Award. And then more recently, Clayton Brown and Monica Long Ross's film, The Believers, won the Gold Hugo in the documentary competition, so that's the award for best documentary in the festival in 2012. Both of these films <coughs> um, and the work of the scientists behind them will be discussed here tonight. Uh, also, just so you know, this year, as part of our 50th anniversary, we started a partnership also with a World Bank program called Action for Climate, and we showcased short films by filmmakers from around the world about how climate change is impacting their um, environment, both in terms of um, um, cultural and scientifically. So as we mark our 50th anniversary this year, it is important for the film festival not only to look back at our rich history, but also look forward to the future of film, including the intersections between film, the sciences, and new technologies. So this is a great moment for us. As Bob mentioned, we truly do believe that films can and do make a difference, and this is part of the film festival's mission. So movies bring people and ideas together, they have the capacity to introduce us to new concepts and ways of thinking and to take us on journeys to places unfamiliar and unknown territories or the terra incognita. And in the process, impact our understanding of and our way of seeing the world. So for this reason, we are pleased to be partnering with C2ST and Columbia College Chicago on this event tonight. And we look forward to developing this new initiative around science and film in the coming year. So I think the brainstorming session tonight is really important for thinking about ways in which we can effectively move forward, both in terms of bringing the filmmaking and scientific communities together here in Chicago around making more films about science and making an impact. But we're also looking forward to showcasing these films um, in programs at next year's festival and making a special effort to program films that have themes that are um, scientific and technological. And we're also looking at the possibility of presenting an award to the top science film in the festival as we are a competitive film festival. So as we take in your ideas and thoughts today, we'll look forward to developing projects and programs in the coming year and presenting them at next year's 51st Chicago International Film Festival. I just have to give a little shout out to the festival. Today is our second to last day, and tomorrow is our Best of the Fest program. So if you haven't been to the festival yet, you still have one more day to catch some great films that are both in our regular program and uh, some ones that have been award winners. So we left some sheets out there to give you information about it. So to begin this here tonight, I'd like to introduce this evening's moderator, Professor Nick Davis. So Nick is an associate professor of English, film, and gender studies at Northwestern University. So his book, The Desiring Image, Image, which is published by Oxford University Press, offers new readings and theories of queer cinema since the late 1980s, including work by non-LGBT directors such as David Cronenberg, Claire Denis, and David Lynch. You'll see his interest in sci-fi film. Um, he is also the author of the film reviews found on Nick Flick Picks and its associate blog and Twitter accounts. And I just found out that he's teaching next term a course in gender, sexuality, and sci-fi cinema. So please extend, oh, I wanted to say one more thing. Along with Bruce Sheridan, who you'll hear from later tonight, Nick is one of our favorite uh, festival moderators. So please extend a very warm welcome to Nick Davis. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the organizations that collaborated to produce this event tonight, and thank you to all the audience members who've come out for it. In fact, clap if you're a scientist. And clap if you're a filmmaker. 
Okay. And, and clap if you're a student of either or both of those things right now. That's really exciting. So it's really great to have all these audiences brought together. And in fact, I'm told by Andrea and some of the others, even more audiences, we are being filmed, as you notice, as we always are, but especially tonight. And, um, and some terrifying number of, of live stream observers is also clocking into this. I've forgotten the number already because it seems so big. But so I want to welcome the live stream audiences and the audiences for the future filming of this. Um, and I'm really glad that these conversations and these ideas will be preserved. Um, I'm couple of announcements as your cruise director. I do want to remind you to mostly silence uh, phones and scientific apparatuses and uh, other devices you may have with you, but not entirely, because you'll see up here that we have a hashtag for the evening, um, science plus cinema, all spelled out, all is one word. And so if you would like to keep involving more people in these discussions, um, we have encouraged apparently people to tweet in their questions and their responses to things that they're hearing as they're following along with the live stream. So we'll maybe even have some conversation tonight with people who are not materially with us. Um, but if you would like to share things that are exciting to you or provocative to you or that you've got communities of people in social media, um, you are in fact being encouraged for that one reason to have your electronic devices out um, and be corresponding. Um, and the last thing I was just gonna say before I turn it over to the people you really wanna hear from is that Mimi was so nice to, well, well read those things about um, what I work on. Um, but I think I'm mostly here tonight partially because I'm like the biggest groupie for the Chicago International Film Festival. I've seen 52 features and 18 shorts already this month. Um, if you're not going, you're missing so much great, fun, nutritious stuff by people I've heard of for 20 years, people I didn't hear of till the morning of. So please do go to the festival. But I'm also really here, even though you just heard my intellectual interests described and they may not sound like science and film to you, um, I'm also an educator in general and an advisor of students. And at my institution at Northwestern, if you say are a literature student or a chemistry student and decide you also wanna be a filmmaking major, you have to transfer from the Arts and Sciences College to the Communications College in order to administratively earn the right to be a double major in those fields. And just the sheer bureaucratic hassle of being told that bringing art and science together um, can be such a, a dumb and arbitrary deterrent. So it's really exciting um, to be at an event with so many of the exact right people coming together to promote why art and science, which is what we say all the time when we talk about our liberal arts traditions, why art and science are perfect complements for each other. It's a great reason to stick with that vision that you have as a student, especially even if you have to go through some lame paperwork process, but hopefully all the ideas mm -hmm. that are gonna come out tonight will encourage you to really follow those visions. And I've also noticed too, when you're a film professor, People like to talk to you about movies, and thank God for that. I love it. But you know, in the past month, I can't believe how many people have told me about the number of, say, articles they're reading about the Ebola virus. And then they say, but I think it does travel through air, because remember that scene in Outbreak um, in the movie theater? <laughs> and it makes me laugh, too, but it also reminds me of how one image, even in a pretty silly film, um, can be so powerful and so indelible that even people who just read how Ebola actually spreads or does not spread have a hard time dislodging themselves from something that they saw and emotionally related to or aesthetically experienced. Um, so I'm really eager to take seriously these connections and be part of this conversation. I'm glad we have so many others who want to do that. So you've heard it already from Bob, but what will happen tonight is that we will be meeting three teams of artistic and scientific collaborators on three different films. Um, they'll be presenting in 15 minute blocks about the films that they um, in some cases, explicitly worked on together all the way through production. In other cases, you'll be hearing scientists in the fields that the films pertain to responding to work they saw only after the films were finished or when they were released. Um, so it, that will vary, the relationship between the collaborators or the conversation partners from moment to moment. Um, I have been encouraged to be draconian about the 15 minutes, so I will attempt to ignore my inner instincts for politeness and cut people off. But after 15 minutes a piece, um, we will have audience Q&A. So if you have a question that's for a specific person who you heard something say, or you wanna ask a question to the scientists or the filmmakers, or you wanna pose a question to the whole group and see who wants to play with that question, please do hold on to it. So 
to kick things off, I will be introducing them in pairs because seven bios will be too much to hold on to through the whole next 45 minutes. Um, the first group that you'll be hearing from were, are, are going to be speaking about and presenting in relation to a film called Head Games um, from 2012. And you've already heard of one of the filmmakers described, and you've, many of you, I'm sure, know him well, Bruce Sheridan, again, the professor, and since 2001, the chair of cinema, art, and science here at Columbia College Chicago. Um, I'm really excited about how Bruce is not only a prize-winning filmmaker, but has been so in features, in documentaries, in shorts, in multiple traditions. So the sheer eclecticism of what film can accomplish at different scales is really crucial to Bruce's body of work and to his investments repeated many places on the web uh, in redesigning film and media education for the 21st century. So he'll be presenting about Head Games, a film he made with Steve James, who you may know from Hoop Dreams or The Interrupters or his film Life Itself that the festival is showing tomorrow. Um, and then you'll be hearing from Peggy Mason, a professor of neurobiology at the University of Chicago. Um, you may or may not have a piece of literature in front of you suggesting neurology, but in fact, a professor of neurobiology um, whose work for at least 25 years, I read, has concerned areas of pain modulation. And listen to this arc from, from what you might think of science to humanistic study. Pain modulation, morphine, how bodies or patients are reacting to substances meant to ease pain, but then recently has been working on this beautiful enterprise and phrase, the biology of empathy. How does empathy actually work? What are the endocrine or chemical ways in which we feel for another person? So Peggy will be bringing her expertise um, about these fields into dialogue about this film. She's already written a piece I encourage you to look at um, on her blog called The Brain is So Cool. In fact, when I looked all the extra vowels on the typeface, I think the blog is actually called The Brain is So Cool. I think that's the formal title. Um, so she'll be commenting on Peggy's afterwards. So I'll turn it over now uh, to Bruce and Peggy. <laughs> Head Games with Steve James, um, it must have been 2012 was when we finished it. Um, what we, don't, we don't have any of the scientists that, um, that worked on the film here because they're in Boston and Philadelphia. But what's going to happen is after I give you some context for the film and show you a couple of clips from it, Peggy is very kindly going to come up here and speak to what has been the most amazing thing about the film for me is the role it played in a public discussion that just blew up around sports concussion once, uh, pretty quickly after the film came out. And Peggy has been very active uh, in connecting her work as a scientist with the whole idea of public discourse about science. We had a fascinating conversation over this at a really nice cafe on the University of Chicago campus a couple of weeks ago. So um, how Head Games came about is um, a guy called Steve Diebeck, who actually had been a, an op ophthalmologist in an earlier life, had cottoned onto this idea that vision is an early and direct indicator of certain brain function, that vision changes when something happens to the brain because vision is dispersed across a lot of the brain. And he had the rights to a book called Head Games by a guy called Christopher Nowinski, who had been a football player at Harvard and then become a WWE wrestler. In fact, uh, the first Harvard WWE wrestler, um, which is, if you watch the film, is, is, is a big part of the story. And so Steve Devick got me involved, and then I introduced Steve James to him, and, and we, we went around in circles, and finally we all ended up doing it together. The, what was the aim of the film? The, the aim of the film was really to make, well, I, the way I think of it is to make the tobacco story of our time. So we wanted to make a film about what we saw as a major health issue centered around the science of brain trauma. Um, it was... It was designed to inject science into public discourse. So you're, if you're old enough to remember the tobacco wars, well, the recent tobacco wars, um, you'll know that uh, some people attacked the whole idea of what was going on with tobacco in, in the health world, and some people just went after Philip Morris or whoever it was that was making the cigarettes, and there was kind of a difference there. So though the NFL and the NHL were, were called to account in our film, Head Games was not conceived as a narrow takedown of any particular sport. And actually, our focus was as much as anything on kids and the parents of kids um, who have the right to be informed about what might happen to them if they whack their head too many times, as some of us have done. Um, later on, ESPN did a sh show that was really specifically targeted at, at the NFL. So we had a strategy of releasing widely and early in the football and hockey seasons because we knew that 
uh, viewers would be watching those games. So if they saw head games and they were watching football and hockey, it would extend and amplify uh, what was going on in, 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 in this very important um, realm of bra brain trauma through sports injury. Um, so, and what that meant is, this is a technical or practical uh, thing that filmmakers have to think about. It meant that instead of just showing, including a whole lot of NFL and NHL footage just directly from those sources, that we could, um, we could make creative choices about how we presented the material and maybe get at the emotion of it a little bit. If I had more time, I'd actually show you a clip that's uh, where we've um, posterized and newsprintized football footage and all sorts of stuff. Um, the way science got into this film was Chris Nowinski was part, or still is part, of the Boston University Center for the Study of Chronic Traumatic, Traumatic Encephalopathy, uh, CTE we'll call it from here on in, um, and is the co-founder of the Sports Legacy Institute, which is basically an organization that asks for the brains of deceased sports people so that they can be investigated. Um, and the other main scientist that we work with is a guy called Douglas Smith, who's the director of the Center for Brain Injury and Repair and a professor of neurosurgery at the per Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. By having those two involved in the film, uh, we were connected to a whole network of research scientists, mainly on the East Coast for this film, in Boston and in, in Philadelphia in particular. And that connected us to Gary Dorshimer, who's in the film, who the, was the... Um, team doctor for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Philadelphia Flyers. So we had this layer of, 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 of involvement from doctors through research scientists working, you know, Doug's research included blowing, um, blowing uh, air on the, on the brains of pigs and showing that even just a short burst of air could cause damage, neuronal damage. So um, the film was, you know, came out at the right time, it came out in the right way and, and really uh, had a big impact. It was a iTunes top three movies of the year, it was a Sports Illustrated top two movies of the year and it, it uh, played in theatres but most importantly it was available in over 100 million homes pretty much from the day that we released it. I even found out that you can re rent a film via Facebook when we did this film, I didn't know that before. Um, so I'm going to show you just two clips um, now from the film and uh, I'd love to show a little bit more and there's a reason for these two clips. I'll explain the reason after these clips play and then Peggy's going to come up and really talk about how this thing happens where you have a film and then you have a scientific subject that becomes part of a public discourse. So Neil, can you roll the two clips for me? That's clips three and four. Thanks. Somehow along the lines, people started talking about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and, and that was the name that sort of stuck. When you're looking at this disease, I think one of the most amazing things is how extraordinarily dense the pathology is. It's like pathology on steroids. In a normal brain, there would be absolutely no brown visible whatsoever. Everything would look this light, light cream color, but you can see that there's tremendous abnormalities throughout the gray matter. Some places it's extremely dense. And then look at it under the microscope, and I have uh, it here, you can see tremendous loss of nerve cells. The remaining cells are scarred and, and filled with this abnormal uh, tau protein, which disturbs the cell and causes it to malfunction, and eventually it dies. So we'll cut into the brain. Really small hippocampus now. That's the memory component, he's got shrinkage of that part of the brain. This disease has these very difficult symptoms. It destroys sort of your personality in a way that observers think, are they just having a midlife crisis? Are they having sort of psychological or an adjustment reaction? But actually it's structural brain disease. When the Andre Waters story went public, the ex-wife of Gene Atkins sent me an email saying, Gene is everything that I read about Andre Waters, the memory problems, the impulse control issues. He was in a very dark place. The only difference is he survived multiple suicide attempts. I've been there. I understand how I feel to want to take your life. And it's a scary feeling because every day I wake up is a challenge for me. I'm just a mess right now. When I saw an opportunity to intervene, I was able to raise some money to fly Gene up along with his current wife to see Dr. Cantu, who spent hours evaluating him. 
978432. Those digits, tell me what they are. 978432. 978. 432. 432. Gene, repeat the months of the year between January let's find, let's find something else. and June. Pardon me? Let's just pick something else to do because I can't do that. Try. January, May, April. Well, I would say Gene Atkins is certainly not alone. Can you do it sequentially, like January, February, March, April? There's a lot of people that are in the January, prime of their lives, but March, their brain has April. not stayed with them. June. What's before June? July. So um, the first clip is Anne McKee, and it's, it's a scientist on screen. And if you watch the whole film, there's not much of that. But when we talk to people after they see the film, they are fascinated to just see something about what scientists do that's relevant to the subject. And then the second clip of Gene Atkins, which I still find hard to watch, even four years after I started working on this film, is just, uh, you know, from my point of view, it's the visible and tangible human devastation of, of CTE. There's just no, no way around it. This is a man who is destroyed in a certain sense and is just enough to know it. And it's very, very sad. Um, uh, my mother has Alzheimer's and if you've had any experience with that disease you'll know that there's a period of the onset where the person's aware that it's happening to them and this is what we saw time and again with these, with these uh, football players and hockey players so um, in order to um, make sure that the really interesting part of the discussion takes place I'm going to stop there and invite Peggy to come up and, and talk to you really about this way that film can get us between uh, what's going on in research science and the public discourse about these things. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and, uh, and I was very, I, I was not involved in the film as Bruce told you, um, but I was really moved by the film and I'm really impressed at, at what it can do for uh, the public's understanding of, of a very important issue, and that is uh, brain injury. Um, I think that uh, what I, what it, one of the things I really like about the film is that it's balanced. It doesn't tell you what the answer is. And I don't actually think the public is so um, simplistic that they would buy the answer if we tried to tell them that we had the answer, which we don't. Um, and I and so what I really like is that the be the the film gives you it gives you the sides. It says brain injury is devastating, and it also tells you that playing sports is a very um, big part of growing up and being a social mammal, which we are. And and I hope that through films like this, which are just sober, they're sober, they're not sensationalist. Um, and they actually give credit to the, to the public, um, credit which I think the public actually deserves, uh, to take in the facts and make up their own mind and make up their own decisions. Uh, and, uh, and there are two sides to this issue. Playing sports is a very valuable thing. Um, brain injury is a very devastating thing. And uh, one of the, one of the quotes that I also really liked was from Bob Costas, which, who said um, something to the effect that um, hitting is maybe, ba maybe incidental to all sports, but it is fundamental to American football. And I think football and, and to a certain extent hockey s sit in, in a very special place. And the other, the other very special um, consideration I think that we have to take into account is who's playing these sports. It's one thing for uh, an adult to play the sport, and it's a different thing for a seven-year-old to play a sport. And it's a really different thing for a teenager to play a sport. I was just at a conference in, in Copenhagen, and the teenagers, they don't have the, uh, the balance on their risk-taking uh, drive that adults have. We adults have this whole developed prefrontal cortex, which gives us some some degree of impulse control, plus or minus, in different individuals. Um, 
But in teenagers, that part of the cortex is just not developed. So they cannot suppress that. Um, they, they don't have the, uh, the same uh, hardware that are available to them to suppress um, uh, in, uh, impulses, very sudden urges and, and, and impulses. And so giving them the, the uh, decision to play or not to play sports that could definitely uh, affect their future is something that I, I think society, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think society should be talking about it. And I think that informed public should be talking about it. Um, I, I'll, s how much time do I have? Okay, so um, I'll say one other thing which I think is uh, a really important piece of, of trying to think about head injury. And that is the concept of uh, discounting. And so the concept of discounting is, uh, from a neurobiological point of view, is if I say, um, I'll pay you five bucks to jump up and down um, in front of an audience, uh, and, and you'll say, thank you very much, give me the five bucks. If I say, I'll pay you five bucks in 10 years to jump up and down, you say, no, thank you, not interested. I, you know, where the hell am I gonna be in 10 years? I don't know. Not interested. And I think that the, uh, the risk of developing CTE to athletes is extremely discounted. And I was really reminded of this recently when the team that was about to go fly to Dallas, uh, Texas to play the, um, the Cowboys in the NFL, they had a meeting to talk about their concerns about contracting Ebola. <laughs> They're worried about Ebola. That team has never had a meeting. I can guarantee you it has never had a meeting to worry about CTE. So this, this works against us, but this is part of who we are, and it's also part of um, who adolescents have not yet become. Adolescents don't have that, uh, that those long-term, the, the ability to make those long-term goals and to, to ignore the short-term uh, rewards. And I think that, uh, that talking about this um, uh, with a degree of neurobiology in mind uh, will be really valuable and I, I'm so thrilled that this film was made and um, I hope you all get a chance to see it. And again, chance to see it is a great reason to be using this hashtag and using this social media. As you're hearing about these films and you want to make sure you remember but everybody else remembers the names and where to find them, um, do be tweeting and texting those things. Um, so our, our next pair of filmmakers uh, worked in a different situation than the one that you just heard about. Here is a case where not only was there explicit collaboration through the making of the film, um, but in fact, uh, the person who you will be meeting as the scientist um, is also the subject of the film. Um, and uh, his own life, not just as a researcher, becomes inveterate to the experience and the storyline of the film. So I think they won't speak in this order, but I'll, I'll introduce first um, Jack Kessler, uh, who is the Ken and Ruth DeVee Professor of Stem Cell Biology at Northwestern, where he also directs the Stem Cell Initiative, um, has worked for quite a long time on the regulation of gene expression by stem cells. So how are stem cells governing or prompting or inhibiting the expression of genetic potential or material, um, which is work that goes into the brain and nervous system, into spinal injuries, into work on Alzheimer's, which we just heard a bit about. Um, collaborating with Jack and making the film is Maria Finizzo, um, a Peabody Award-winning director and producer of multiple films. And you also heard from Mimi that Maria um, is a winner on this film um, for the Chicago Award at the Chicago International Film Festival. Um, Maria's body of work is really eclectic and hopefully is one way of, of reminding us that to work on any one idea or any conjunction of ideas like art and science is not to do it in a predictable way or do it in the same way every time out. Maria has made award-winning, attention-getting films about female adolescence, about aging out of the foster care system, about ballet, about Title IX as both a, a breakthrough in sports policy but also a, a case study of democratic process. 
um, and is currently, I believe, in post-production or has just finished a film called Living Revolution um, that takes a really multidisciplinary, ecological, sociological, political, gender-informed, anthropological survey um, of, of changing tides for indigenous people in Bolivia at the moment. Um, so I think Maria will speak first, um, and then we'll hear afterward from Jack about Terra Incognita from 2007. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about how this film came about, and um, and then Jack and I'll talk about his role in the film and what that felt like for him because it was a very generous thing for him to say yes to me. So after I finished way back in 2001 when I'd finished my last film, um, I was wandering around looking for the next film, and it's always a difficult time for a filmmaker because you don't think you're ever going to find another idea. And stem cell research was in the news all the time. George Bush was the president, and every other day there was something about stem cell research, and it was an extremely polarizing debate around stem cell research, so there was nothing rational about the debate. And I decided that this would be a great topic for the next film. Oops, can you hear me? And I wanted to make a film that put a human face on stem cell research, right? So that was not just about the extremes of the dialogue, the extremes driving the dialogue around this science. I also wanted to make a film which looked at what it meant to do science in a democratic society. And stem cell research was a great topic for that because everybody had an opinion about it. Keeps going in and out. Anyway, um, I needed a story. Lower it. Can't hear me. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so a way into any, I'm, I'm the bias of my filmmaking is that a way into any topic is that you need a story. And usually that story needs to be about someone. And so while I was wandering around looking for a way into stem cell research, I read um, an article in the Tribune about Jack, about his work, about um, his daughter Allison, and about what he was trying to do. And I remember thinking, wow, this is a wonderful story. But I took the article and I stuffed it in my pocket and I thought he'll say no to me. And I walked around with it in my pocket for about three weeks and then finally sent him a letter. And I thought I've got one run at this man, right? He's a busy guy, he does not need a film crew in his life. And so when I wrote the letter, I said, here's what I'm trying to do. I want to create a dialogue around stem cell research. I want to put a human face on it. And then it took me a while to get up the nerves to call him. And when I did, he agreed to meet with me. And I'm gonna let him take it from there. Well, it was, a, it was a period of time uh, when there were all kinds of uh, misleading statements being made, misconceptions about stem cell biology. Um, I also think there are a lot of misconceptions about scientists in general, uh, the way people look at scientists, why they're doing things. Uh, Maria came and talked to me, and the first thing I actually asked was to see some of the things they had done before, uh, because there's no reason to do it if it's not going to be quality. Uh, we looked at them. Uh, it really was quality work, and then I spoke with my daughter because she would inevitably be drawn into this. My daughter had had a spinal cord injury, so I was now working to try to come up with a cure for spinal cord injury. So we decided that it was an opportunity to get the message across to people about the reality of stem cell research, what it meant to be a stem cell researcher, to put a face uh, on uh, what it means to be a scientist, and also to correct some of the misconceptions uh, about stem cell biology. So I said yes to Maria. And I, I want to just point out here, and I, I have said this many times, that when Jack said yes, he committed to me wholeheartedly. And he had a really busy job, right? He's a busy man. And having a film crew in your life is not always fun. But no matter when I contacted him or what I asked him to do, he said, okay, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, I might tell me to get lost at some point because you, you have better things to do. But anyway, in the course of filming, um, making the film, I, um, the clip I'm gonna show you arose um, the very first time I interviewed Jack. We went to his home and we were sitting in front of a computer looking at antique maps and I asked him about antique maps and at that very moment he 
made an argument for how science is like the study of antique maps. And, and it's a beautiful metaphor for the film. And I knew at that point that I had um, sort of the central metaphor that I would wrap the entire film around. So I'm going to show you um, the clip that comes dead center in the middle of the film and um, I think really caps, you know, really captures what it means to do science today. So roll the clip. Oh, something bad just happened. Oh, what is going on? Hi. Hello. I got a problem. Everything was going fine, and then suddenly this whole piece just ch chipped off. Like, the hardest part I, have you ever had this before? of what we do is the anxiety and the frustration. Yeah, I've had that happen once, but. It's very easy to think things done and very hard to actually go do them in the laboratory. I'm just cutting out the gouged part. Trim this part off. Yeah. And then just remount it. Patience is just something that you have no choice. You have to have it. All right, well. Whether it's a change in our daily routine or a change in the way we think about the entire world. Change is always difficult to deal with. And science does change the world. and forces us to begin to think how we're gonna live our lives in a different way. There was a time when it was considered heresy to say that the Earth was not the center of the universe. This is basically the earliest acquirable map of the Western Hemisphere. When it was considered heresy to say that the world was not flat. That's what maps kind of remind you. They see things changing. This is magnificent. Yeah. At some point, somebody reported that you could sail around California. California became an island in the 1600s, even though they had it right in the 1500s. In those days, everybody believed it. That was the reality. And the same thing is true now with a lot of issues about stem cell, where there are myths being told about stem cells, where people firmly believe things that just simply aren't true and we have to change attitudes. So one of the reasons um, why I chose that scene is because it, it introduces you to two of Jack's very, very talented researchers. And it also shows how it just is a painstakingly slow process. And when I got here tonight, Jack and I started gabbing with each other. And, um, you can sort of share with people sort of, he started telling me about where they were in the research. And, and I was just listening to him struck with, it's a very long process and progress is slow, right? Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I mentioned to her, I, I was very proud that after I wrote a final draft of a manuscript today of a gene therapy trial that we had done that was successful, that I'm hoping is really gonna be the first time we've been able to regenerate part of the nervous system. And I, and I told her, actually, I was thinking back, I actually started the experiments for this 17 years ago. Uh, and it's taken us 17 years to get to the point where we did the human trials to prove that it works. And we still have to go do another trial to be able to convince the FDA to let us mark this drug. So 15 to 20 years is about what it takes uh, to move from an idea to actually changing things uh, in medicine. And I, I think the other thing that uh, ama was amazing about this whole experience is that um, Northwestern and Jack just led us into their lab. And the grad students were very generous in having us around. Vicki was one of the ones we ended up focusing on quite a bit. And I'm quite sure she had a lot more to do than explain to us repeatedly what she was doing. Um, and I think that openness that you brought to this project, which was okay, here you, go, here you go, you can come in and film everything that's going on, was evidence of a real, um, certainly generosity, but also confidence 
in his process and confidence in his grad students and the, and the way he had runs his lab, right? Because we were all over the place. And um, I, I just I think about that a lot, and I think it took a lot on everyone's part to um, collaborate with us, and I, I really do think they were all our collaborators. I mean, I repeatedly asked people to explain to me, okay, now tell me again what you're doing. Help me understand this. And we went, you know, Jack was the person that I, whose voice I wanted to be prominent in the film, and I wanted him to tell the audience what stem cell research was, and so he very carefully went through all of the issues for us, and it was, it was a great experience. How are we doing on time? Five more minutes. How about some questions? Yeah. It really didn't impact the, the research at all. Um, as Maria mentioned, this was an era, the Bush era, when, which was very much, you know, stem cells were a real controversy. There was also actually distinctly anti-scientist uh, tendencies in the, uh, on the administration at the time. And I think this, um, among many other things, helped change uh, public attitudes. I mean, when we started, there was a lot of resistance. By the time we finished this, I, I gave uh, on average one talk a week, one public outreach talk a week for about 10 years uh, for that reason. And now the overwhelming majority of people in this country support stem cell research. So, you know, I think this one film was a wonderful film, a Peabody Award winner, shall not mention that, but it really was a wonderful film. But it was only one small piece of changing public attitudes. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the back? Yes. Uh, I saw the trailer of your film that you were, you were accomplishing the science to the trailer of the film you presented. I saw it, and in the film you testified before Congress about you know, what you were doing. Uh, what two part question is this? Um, obviously, they responded not favorably to, to, your, to your work. Why do you, what do you think was the biggest? What did I think what was? The well, the biggest uh, biggest impediment is ignorance, as always. Uh, people don't understand, and then they think they know uh, when they really don't know, and you somehow have to overcome the ignorance. You can't call them ignorant. You just have to try to educate them. Um, so I, well, you lose the battle as soon as you uh, use the wrong words. But you have to try to educate them, make them understand. It's sometimes very frustrating. Uh, another time, I remember going to Springfield. We were trying to get the uh, the state legislature uh, to support some things you're doing, and I had several of the people there say to me, "Well, you know, Doctor, we actually agree with you, but we're going to vote against you because otherwise we might lose the next election." I mean, I was literally told that. Fortunately, they got voted out of office the next election, so uh, things went well. And I think it's because people became. <laughs> Uh, th people became educated and they stopped believing some of the wild stories and started understanding, wow, this is something that could help my mother, father, brother, sister, whatever, who has a, a serious or fatal disease. Who could be against it? I think it's more that science is about change. We were talking about that in, in the movie, and people are always resistant to change, and particularly you know, people who are controlling things always feel a little threatened by change, so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Are, are we running out of time? Thank you. Are we done? Okay. So as we now anticipate hearing from our third team of collaborators, uh, this is a slightly different case even than the first two, so this is not a case where the, the, the scientist is in the film, but it was a case of, of, of a really ongoing relationship of collaboration and advising that goes on in an organization called One Three 
seven films that we're going to hear a little bit about. Um, this is also a case, since we're celebrating anniversaries tonight, 137 Films, I think just on Friday, celebrated a 10th birthday, um, which is worth applauding for, I would suggest. <laughs> You'll know why you're clapping when you hear about the organization that you're applauding. Uh, so the, the two, the executive director and the artistic director of 137 Films are here with us tonight, Monica Long-Ross and Clayton Brown. Um, they have been collaborating through this particular enterprise um, since about 2008 um, and have made films starting with The Atom Smashers, which you may have seen through Independent Lens on TV about the pursuit of the Higgs boson, which I believe was the project by which they came into contact with Mark Aurelia. I may be misstating, but they'll clear that up. If that, oh, I'm getting nods that that's true. Good. It's always better to be right. Um, who is a professor in physics at the University of Chicago and was among the international group of scientists who discovered the Higgs boson. Um, so that relationship has remained quite fruitful and I think is an inspiring goad to remember that these relationships you may form in a particular project can continue in unexpected ways in future projects. So I think they'll probably talk a good bit about a film called The Believers um, that they finished in 2012. Mimi mentioned it won the Gold Hugo for Best Documentary at the International Film Festival. And I saw a lot of those documentaries and they were really good ones. So it's a big, I was there the night you won and was clapping right along with everybody else. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, Clayton also has made short films, science fictional speculations. It's not all documentary, and in fact, um, and, and also films about faith, um, since we're talking about breaking down barriers of, of who, people who think about this versus people who think are concerned about that. Um, these are really interesting careers to read more about and explore some to, to see lots of those divisions get broken down. So I want to welcome again Clayton and Monica and Mark Aurelia to talk about their film, The Believers, and their other collaborations. <laughs> It works now. All right. All right. Um, I'll start um, where and tell you a little bit about 137 films because we're a little different than the other two collaborations. Um, yes, 10 years ago, or a little over 10 years because we sort of, um, I think we timed that according to when we became a not-for-profit. Um, a group of Northwestern students and one Columbia College graduate um, got together and we decided from the very beginning that we were going to take our stories out of the world of science. And whereas I will not explain um, the 137 because I always get it wrong, um, I call it a magic number within physics and physicists. Um, I don't know if they take to the magic, but Mark can explain 137. But from the very beginning, we decided to look on science as a very deep well of untold stories that we could draw from over and over again. And that, like Mar what Maria said, we are also interested in story because we come out of narrative film, I come out of theater and playwriting, and we're very interested in taking narrative storytelling and wedding it with science. We're proud of the fact that we always include science in, in and do not slight the science, but we are always explaining to our scientists how you are a character and we are following you and we are interested in who you are and what you do and what your trials and tribulations are. So um, that's 137 Films, and he said about, we started with a very esoteric science of high energy physics, and our second one, we went to cold fusion, which is almost a pop culture kind of approach to science. Um, and uh, so we'll show our clip. We wanna show our trailer, uh, which has several clips in it, and then we'll talk about the believers. So show our clip. Good afternoon, everybody. This is James Martinez live for another special edition of Cold Fusion Radio. It's my feeling that this subject matter, Cold Fusion, is the key to liberating the human race. Basically, we've established a sustained nuclear fusion reaction, and with this process, there is a considerable release of energy. What may be a tremendous scientific advance tonight in attempts to create and harness the almost limitless clean power 
of nuclear fusion. You can wield the power of nuclear physics on a tabletop that changes everything. The University of Utah bookstore is reporting record sales of fusion t-shirts. The toast of Utah. Scientists yeah. are just like anybody else. Some people wear sports team wear and, and we wear chemicals. What it was was a, 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 a soda and they put these things in it that went pop, pop, pop uh, randomly and they called it the cold fusion. They were threatened, death threats. Tell me about cold fusion. I want to make a million dollars, and if you don't tell me, I'm going to kill you. I mean, this is not how scientists behave. This is a bullfight or a Italian soccer. When we ignite that cold fusion fire, I mean, just imagine. As time went on, and it wasn't much time, scientists began to smell blood. We have no evidence in our laboratory. The specifically. background, I beg your pardon, the background is available in the corrections to the paper. That might be. I don't think we anticipated the abuse they got. The science head at DOE said you could tell by looking at these two that they were incompetent boobs. That's personal. Do you think there was greed involved? Oh, absolutely. Down there someplace there's also the good of mankind, but that's not what gets it started. This is the electrolyte itself. I am putting serious time into this. I believe that it's real. A teacher from math said we are not sure what he's doing. Yes. For me to stand up and tell people that I have what Einstein was dreaming of his whole life, you know the word chutzpah? We know, we absolutely have proven beyond a doubt that it's real. A millisecond's worth of euphoria, and at that point scientific reality set in. But this is, it can't be. There's a cold fusion cruiser surfing the ion reefs just at the edge of the solar system. The best thing that could have happened here is if Kim Kardashian was sitting here. Then it would have been all over the place. I wouldn't want to spend my life that way. But these guys want to question whether there's cold fusion. Hey, that's up to them. Sooner or later, somebody will be able to see the theory, the mechanism that is actually operating. Once we get that, then all hell's going to break loose. So everyone here tonight is interested in where science and art and story collide. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we came uh, upon this subject. As Monica mentioned, we had just finished uh, The Atom Smashers, which was a story about Fermilab's search for the Higgs boson uh, that Mark was participating in at the University of Chicago. Uh, a very esoteric subject about some extremely difficult science. And it was our intention to tell that story. And so that was a story that we followed in real time and there were exciting discoveries and like Maria did call, hey, what's going on? Can we come out and film this? And during the filming of that, we often heard, you know, we were searching for, can you, can you tell us what's happening? Is there a discovery? We don't want another cold fusion incident. We heard that quite a bit. And as we were wrapping up filming, Monica and I were, our curiosity was piqued by this, this cold fusion incident. We had, we knew some vague knowledge of what had happened back in 1989. But we started looking into it and the more we learned about this story, the deeper and more layered it got. And as storytellers, Layers and depth and controversy are what really gets, gets us hooked. And so there were all of these themes that started to emerge. Uh, as you saw, um, this, this type of science or this particular event spilled over into culture, into popular mainstream media. So some of the themes that started to really emerge was what happened when science collided with the media? What happened when science uh, intersected with greed and with this utopian dream for a perfect solution? And it got really messy, especially because some, some key fundamental science um, rules, if you will, were, were violated and the whole thing just exploded. As he said, this is not how scientists behave. This is a bullfight, this is Italian soccer. 
So it, it really was an amazing um, mess, and I think Mark can talk some about uh, what happens when science goes about itself in the wrong way. And that revealed a lot that we found really compelling. And so the way we decided to, uh, well, some of the challenges that we, that we found were, for one thing, it happened in 1989. This was very different from the story we had just finished. And so we had this story that was already done. How do you bring that to life? Luckily, there was a, an enormous trove of archival footage there were some people around that remembered it very well. Mark and maybe some of the other scientists in the room can testify that many scientists can pinpoint where they were when they heard about cold fusion. It's kind of a, a, a seminal moment in the, in the recent history of American science. So we found that uh, it was a challenge to bring that to life and weave it with the current story, which is that there are some people that are still pursuing this work today. So that became an interesting challenge for us that we found really exciting. Uh, and we found some characters who were just as passionate now about it as they were back in 1989. And so our approach, um, we quickly decided that the least interesting aspect of the story was actually whether or not cold fusion was real. That film had already been made by several other different people, and the only thing that that can do is devolve into either he said, he said, or she said, but there weren't too many female scientists in this particular story, but, or, yeah, we, we did, uh, or, a very dense explanation of nuclear fusion, which neither one of which we wanted to explore. So for us, the story became an exploration of the scientific method itself. And so what happens when science kind of goes wrong? And uh, this, the film became almost a, a document about um, the scientific method itself. And we, ra we wanted to raise more questions than we answered, and some of the questions we wanted to raise are, what do you do? How do you approach science? What's the right way to approach science? What, what's the wrong way to think about science? So in some ways, we wanted our viewers to think about science as scientists do. And so by telling this story and by bringing questions into the minds of viewers, we sort of turned our viewers into scientists. And many of the, the conversations we had at the end of the film were just really robust discussions uh, full, of, full of incredible viewpoints uh, that we found really heartening because um, not only were they about the story, they were about the science and they were about the scientists and about our relationship with science and about culture's relationship with science. So um, I'll let Mark kind of finish up uh, as the scientist, Mark was in our first film, and so we did develop this relationship. So, It's a good relationship. Uh, Monica and, and Clayton developed a loyal following in the uh, greater Chicago area where there are a lot of particle physicists. That's what I do. There's Fermilab and Argonne, University of Chicago and Northwestern uh, and UOI. And, and um, we, we were happy when you embarked on the Atom Smashers. Uh, we were wondering, you know, where NOVA has failed so many times before, how could you possibly do it? And it was, you succeeded by going after the right angles. Uh, you explained the science well enough, but that wasn't the point of your story. You went after the passion for why people devote 18 hours a day to this, to going after something they believe in. And uh, it, that's the one segue to your, your, your next film. So while you had enormous participation by stellar people in the Chicago area for the first film, um, when you asked around for a science advisor for the Cold Fusion film, nobody accepted, including myself. <laughs> so that, uh, it was such a hot potato. And uh, w seeing the film, again, you just, sh you, you took where you were at, in the Atom Smashers and, and went much further into, as you said, the layers of the story. There, there are no three, th three themes I find in that film that are just stimulating. There's, there's the violation of the scientific process. That, that's uh, probably the thing that I, I know that you, you feel most passionate about, the reason that uh, 
there was bloodlust here. It was that uh, a, a well-prescribed procedure that protects science and, and makes scientific results uh, just incredibly solid these days was violated, not only by these two investigators, but by the universities and other organizations that had to support this fantastic claim. There was the uh, enormously interesting um, relationship between an elder statesman of science and his young protege, and how the younger person really did things that were just ridiculous uh, under the guidance of, of, of the elder. Um, and uh, I must say that the, uh, well, uh, the University of Chicago has done nothing wrong in my, my book. Uh, uh, the University of Utah uh, is part of the, the criminal effort in, in this uh, uh, situation. About Martin Fleischman and Stanley Pons, who were the first two scientists to um, uh, come out and say that they had discovered at a press conference uh, that, was, fusion. that was the sin. Uh, the scientific process was violated. Peer review was, uh, uh, was not invoked before a, a public release of, a, of a, uh, a rather out, well, I won't say outlandish, but an important, an important enough discovery that we should have followed the scientific rules. But anyway, you, 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 you magnificently focus in on, on, on these, these points, and it's uh, uh, all of the scientists who refuse to be on your uh, uh, advisory team loved the film. <laughs> <laughs> there was another, um, how much time do we have? Okay. Uh, one other aspect that um, we found kind of interesting was there, there was seeing scientists in, in public doing things that most of the time are behind closed doors I think was very revealing. One of the things that we heard about fairly often was this tension between chemists and physicists. And in this particular case, the chemists were doing nuclear fusion, or they thought they were at least, which is clearly in the territory of the physicists. And there may have been a particular robustness in the negative response on the part of the physicists because of this. And I don't know if, if you want to talk to that. For not to comment. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps that was there. But and in uh, another area, oh, can I say one thing? Is that we had the last interview with Martin Fleischman, and um, he passed away soon after we opened our film. And um, there, he's the elder statesman that Mark is referring to. And it really was, um, he was reluctant, and he had Parkinson's disease and it was difficult for him to talk, and he was very reluctant to talk about a great many things about this incident, but it really, in the film, it's really, if you have the emotional heart of it, is the fact of why did he, who was known for um, um, several uh, interesting discoveries and science, ruin his whole career on the basis of something like cold fusion. And that remains a mystery. We didn't answer all those questions, but it ends with him sitting alone, and it, it is a very um, That's the, the personal arc mm -hmm. is what really also drew us in, right. but we gotta stop. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. So I have so many questions, which I assume can only mean that you all have several questions as well. So I think we're going to take about 15 minutes, maybe, for, uh, for open audience Q&A. And again, um, you may have a question for a specific filmmaker or a specific team, or for the scientists or the filmmakers or anybody who wants to field it. Um, so um, maybe if I'll invite the, 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 the filmmakers to stand up here, and I'll, I can pass the mic to whoever is taking the question. So, uh, yeah, we'll just pass the mic. Okay. Um, so shall I walk the mic through the audience? Okay. So I see, I saw a hand right back here, right at the beginning. Organization that uh, shares a lot of the same goals. I'm wondering if anybody here is aware of that organization or if there's any tie-in with them. I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. We are not. No, I'm not. 
Sorry. <laughs> but I guess we should find out, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> Premises, the premises, you know, filmmakers find, get hooked up with scientists to get the science right. And so um, if you are not aware of them, I would encourage you to look, look into it. Okay. Hey, how you doing? Bruce, I'm one of your MFA students. How's it going? We haven't met, but we will soon. Well, it's always good to meet in an event. So that's, uh, uh, candidate, actually. Anyway, uh, this is more so for, I guess, any of the scientists and any of the scientists in the audience, but it would be a cousin towards head games, kind of. Um, what do you guys think of the speculation? I don't know if you guys have seen this in the news about the um, artificial turf uh, soccer fields and um, the known carcinogens in the materials. I mean, what's your take on that? Because there's no studies about it yet, and it's a pretty big deal. I know nothing on that. <laughs> Jack? It's just not my area. Yeah, it's not not my area. I, I do brains, not cancer. That's cool. <laughs> so what do you know about it? Uh, no, they're just saying that uh, the soccer fields that are uh, not, I don't have any kids, but our children are um, playing on are made of uh, like used tires and all kinds of materials and they have carcinogens in them and a lot of uh, former soccer players now have um, cancer. Um, it's pretty bad. You just um, check they, it out. They're, ge they're getting uh, lymphoma um, and it's the goalies and they say the goalies are getting it because they land so hard and that they get all that stuff. So you know something about it. I, I, yeah. I don't know anything about us as a scientist, but I do have a um, friend whose daughter was a goalie, and she, at the age of 21, got lymphoma. So. Well, One of the things that this brings to my mind is the, the old chestnut of the distinction between correlation and cause. Always when you're trying to make films that relate to science, you run into, I mean, we found this with head games the whole time, that people would just say they'd seen certain things that they, they inferred cause from that, or they hadn't seen certain things, and so you couldn't infer cause from it. But scientists are usually very, very good at, at telling you what you can and cannot infer. And I don't, and I'm, I'm, I hate to say this, but I don't think journalists read that very much. Um, I think that what happens in the media is that often it's a headline that's just, you know, a lot of goalies got lymphoma or something, and there's science to be done, and there may be something about that to be found out. But as I think Jack said, science takes a long time. A lot of these things take a long time. I don't know how long that's been going, uh, Jack's work's been going on. So we, I feel, feel as a filmmaker that you're always struggling with this um, tension between uh, we need an answer, we need it now, we saw these two things side by side, let's infer cause on the one side of it. And you know, filmmakers have to get their films made and pretty quickly, otherwise they're not gonna be filmmakers for very long. And then on the other side, sometimes you run into scientists who are just not prepared to ever say what's going on, but to keep doing the experiments, I think it's fair to say. You know? So there's a tension there and that's something that as we bring the communities more together, we need to negotiate. And, and, and this is exactly how it usually starts. You know? There's people say X and you just can't, I don't think you can make a feature film around people saying X. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. I will say that when we were doing the Atom Smashers, we were told what happens when, what if they find the Higgs right after you close the film? <laughs> and, and you know, it's like there is always that tension that something big may happen right after you get, you say the end and you put it out there. Um, we, we have, just like with the believers, we felt that the 
the story we had to tell was about the journey, was about the trying to discover something, and so we were comfortable with that. But Particle Fever then came out and told the story of the finding of the Higgs, you know, at CERN. But um, I think the Atom Smashers is still, it's the process that took place in the long journey to try to find the Higgs before it was actually found. So they, you make a document you hope that's relevant about your time. I'm used to lecturing so I can speak loudly, but, uh, but I think your question brings up another an issue implicit in it, and, and uh, do people trust scientists? I know the new story article you're talking about, which is about how um, uh, recycled rubber has been put in as a fake soil in these uh, playing fields, and, and it's been deemed by the appropriate scientific laboratories to be safe. Uh, and uh, I know this is probably the subject of your next film, but, but uh, one of the tensions that we constantly face is the um, um, abil well, uh, ability or inability of um, uh, uh, an ignorant public, and I use that word very carefully, you don't know you know, the quantum chromite dynamics of the proton. Of course not. It's our job to try and communicate that, or at the very least in a product, to tell you that we've looked at it and it's safe. This is a big tension in, in the, the two communities. Yeah, I'd like to say thanks for the inspiration to all the panel. But my question was concerning stem cell research. What would you measure, how would you best measure the, um, the impact of your studies? And the research. How would I, the impact of my study or stem cell biology in general? Well, specifically. I mean, my study. work is, of course, just one small part of a major effort. It's going to revolutionize medicine. It's going to change the way we do everything. Uh, in the past, all we've been able to do really is treat symptoms, uh, treat, you know, relieve pain, do things. Now we'll actually be able to regenerate organs. As I commented to you before, what I've been working on for 17 years. Maybe for the first time we gen regenerated a small piece of the nervous system. So it can change everything we do. That's, uh, I mean, we heard the comment about working 18 hours a day on physics. I don't understand that. But I, under <laughs> uh, but I can understand working 18 hours a day and trying to cure disease. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that's why. Because you change, you have to change everything. And it's not my efforts or any one person's efforts. It's collectively we, we do that. So I have a bit of a general question, I guess, coming from a science background. I, I know the films presented tonight and a lot of what people have worked on is documentary filmmaking and sort of the current what scientists are doing. But I get sort of the feeling from both media and uh, Hollywood a bit that there's this feeling that science is bringing us towards sort of an undesirable end, right? So this pessimist view of science fiction and the future and what uh, scientists are really doing for us, sort of, and I get the feeling that it's sort of for storytelling, right? So uh, people who are watching the media want, you know, a, a better story or some underdog or something like that. And so scientists don't really get their say in that we really think the, the future is going to be beautiful and I don't see a lot of that represented in filmmaking today. So I, I would like your comments, I guess. I think, um, I think the media uh, wants people to be afraid. And so they, they want people to watch. And so they take a story and they look for a way of scaring the hell out of everybody. And if you have watched television in the last five days, you know what I'm talking about, Ebola. And I think Hollywood is peddling, they're peddling doom, right? They want to get people into the movie theaters. And so they want you to watch how everything is going to be horrible, how many, how many more times can we watch the morning after film. Now we have zombies eating people, and, and I think that's just part of the entertainment business, right, because that's what they think people, people like to be afraid, and so that's part of entertainment, and that's, I think, what's happening. I'd say it's pretty hard. There, are, there is an, um, the Sloan Foundation uh, has a huge initiative, and they work with the Sundance Institute, and they fund films that are based on real science. They're trying to get kind of that that voice in Hollywood entertainment. I think it's an uphill battle, and it's it's difficult. I, I think you start in education. 
I think that um, we've had an education system for so long in the West that has separated art and science, that that's actually at the root of the problem. And that now we have technologies and social media and all this stuff that gives us the opportunity for the first time to go back to the reality for human beings, which is being imaginative and creative is the same thing, whether you're doing it for science or for art. It's the same function, it's just deployed in a different way. And so uh, we, to me, it's a two-generational task that we have that'll be... If it works, it'll be way past I'm being around, you know. <laughs> but I think we have to start it now, and I think it's ha starting to happen. We have to encourage uh, young filmmakers and young scientists to feel that they're doing, they're in the same world, and they're doing the same things. Um, but right now, the way Hollywood has to work is, is that's um, a forced alloy, you know. It's basically two different metals. Let's force them together and see if we can make some money out of it. But what we really need is is a movement that just says science and art, filmmaking in this case, are uh, simpatico. They happen together and sometimes they can go in one direction and be devastating and sometimes they can be um, hopeful and entertaining but they're not by definition, you know, as Maria said, I think it's right on the money. Right now the only way really to use it is to scare the hell out of you. Um, you know, Walking Dead right now or something like that. I will also say um, as we, we had a, a pretty a multi-year relationship with Fermilab and we talked with not only scientists but the PR department there and I'll, I'll lay a little bit of this at the, f at the feet of scientists in that scientists are not necessarily the best storytellers about what they do and we heard many times from not only scientists but also people who work with scientists we need to do a better job of, of telling people what we do, because it's, it's easy for us to just do our work and kind of stay, with, stay in our labs, talk to each other, talk to our peer review, and it's often easy, and I'm speaking for scientists, I shouldn't do it, I realize, but I heard enough scientists say this, it's often difficult to have a good relationship with the public and say, what we're doing is really cool. And so scientists have been doing a lot better about that in recent years, and it's a very hot topic right now to, to talk about storytelling in science. And the AAAS convention was just here recently, and we did a, a workshop about telling your story in science. And for a lot of scientists, that's, that's still very difficult. Would you, would you agree? I, I actually, um, I was about to say exactly the same thing, Clayton, and I, and I think that scientists do have to uh, bear some of the blame. I think there are two things. One is that in, in the sociology of science, going uh, and being a public spokesperson for science is looked down upon. It's like, why aren't you in the lab? Why are you spending two possible hours out of the 24 talking to the public? Um, so there's that kind of, you know, science machismo, and um, and the and the second reason is that I think scientists, amongst other experts, politicians, econo economists, they all underestimate the, the public. And, and what I have found in my experience in communicating with the, with the public is um, they may not have the words and they may not have the vocabulary, but they certainly have the smarts. And if the scientist can't explain something to somebody who doesn't know anything about it, then the scientist doesn't know enough about it themselves. They don't understand it well enough themselves. And so I, and I think that, that with some um, work uh, and with some imagination uh, and commitment, you can make anything that you understand, you can make it comprehensible to any smart being from age very young to age very old. Uh, thank you very much uh, right. to you all uh, collectively and the uh, Council on Science for putting this event together. I'm, I'm uh, fired up. <laughs> uh, question for all of you, uh, the panel. Uh, first, uh, the neurobiologist, uh, which Neurobiology. neurobiology uh, we, uh, you talked about in the movie, the, uh, the Head Games movie, about how um, the impact of violent, you know, sports and hitting and so forth and so on, sorry. Have you did any research in terms of socioeconomic uh, factors that relate to brain damage, you know, homelessness, unemployment, things like that, that it's, does 
can, can you just clarify for me um, which way around you're asking this? So in, for, in Head Games, during the process of making that film, um, outcomes in life, like homelessness and bankruptcy and different things, o often came up. They were often what sent the signal that something was wrong for somebody. Um, the, the film, in a way, started, uh, in some ways, started out when Dave Jewison committed suicide, who was mm -hmm. the bear in the uh, 84 Bears that won the Super Bowl. And, um, you know, this was a guy that had gone downhill from being a guy that was thought would be the first black president of the United States, and, and he had gone right downhill. And uh, so, yeah, behavioral outcomes are usually the thing that makes people start saying what's wrong with this person and then the organic cause is, is found. But mm -hmm. um, it sort of sounded like you were saying the other way around maybe that if people are in a certain socioeconomic zone are they more inclined to get head injuries? Is that what you're saying? Right, when in it, the qu yes, the question more specifically is related to, well I haven't seen your movie to be honest, I only saw the trailer uh, and from what I can see from the trailer it uh, and what the, what I read about it, uh, it was related to sports, more so I thought. But my question, yes, specifically was related around the uh, socioeconomic factors that relate to uh, uh, the disease. Well, in the film, one of the mothers of one of the, the kids who plays football says that that keeps the kids off the streets. And this is a, a reflection of the environment that they're living in. And she's, she's worried about what's going to happen to her kid getting all the hits playing football, but she's more worried about what's going to happen to the kid on the streets if he's not occupied doing something. That's a pretty much a socioeconomic situation, right? All right. And the last, last question, I'll be brief. Yes, I'll, I'll be brief. The uh, Cold Fusion uh, movie, uh, when you said that the, the research that Fleshman, I, I remember reading about that years ago, the research uh, went wrong. Uh, what what were you referring to? They they didn't pr pursue the scientific method and peer review and so forth. In 1989, two professors at the University of Utah announced that they had discovered cold fusion, that it was a s source of energy that could be made on a tabletop. They did it at a press conference. And the, uh, there was lots of controversy uh, afterwards if they had any peer review at all because they supposedly went to the airport and mailed their um, study in to somebody right before, or like a week before they made this announcement, but some people said they did it afterwards. So they didn't follow the protocol. You, yeah. you, when you discover something that defies the laws of physics, you are supposed to give it to another lab to yes. work on and see if they, and you give it to five or six labs and then you talk Moving about wrong. it a great deal yes. before you tell the public, we've solved all your energy problems. That's what we're referring and to. And the gentleman, uh, I'm sorry, I just want to get there. Right, the doctor, okay. What was the biggest uh, public misconception regarding stem cell research? It's kind of hazy because it was so long ago, but what was the number well, one thing? There were a number of uh, misconceptions. First of all, one of the biggest things uh, that we had to deal with, people confused the concept of abortion and stem cell biology. Somehow they were getting linked and they have absolutely nothing at all uh, to do with one another. Yet if you were to ask people, is there some sort of relationship, uh, many people would think. So that was uh, kind of the, uh, number one thing we had to face. Number two that we had to face is the idea that you're destroying a human being when you're uh, working with human embryonic stem cells. And, uh, you know, uh, you then get down to a debate about whether a ball of cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells represents a human being. I, I, the overwhelming majority of scientists would tell you that's not a human being, that's a ball of eight cells. There are other people who endowed those eight, little ball of eight cells with a lot of characteristics that they don't have. And so uh, there's just a lot of fundamental misunderstanding. Then a lot of people, when they would hear about destroying embryos, would in their mind have a little picture of a little baby uh, somehow being destroyed without understanding no one was destroying a baby. Uh, you were talking about taking uh, a little group of eight cells and taking some cells from that little group of cells. So giving a good picture of what was going on and separating it from other issues like abortion was really very, very difficult.
Well, yes, of course, I, you know, without wanting to go into it, um, you know, one of the biggest things we faced were, uh, I, it happens, a prominent theologian uh, called me a murderer, uh, not something that I um, liked very much, uh, being branded uh, a murderer because I was using uh, human embryonic stem cells. So yes, religion Im impinged upon it, and religion and science sometimes don't mix, and there's really not a reason that they can't mix, but it's, uh, it's dogma, it's change, and religion is not very well tuned to change. So I love the idea of, of telling stories about scientists and who they are and how science works as a very human story. I think that's really important. But the number one story I hear in, uh, in science journalism and in, in documentary filmmaking and science broadcasting is the story of the, the lone um, you know, genius who is railing against the scientific establishment because he's got this great idea and he's not being listened to. And that really sort of misrepresents how science works in a, in a, in a very fundamental level. But it's an incredibly romantic story to tell. This one person who may just have the ideas that solves all the problems. And that's a very common narrative. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that and how, how we, as a, as, a, as a artistic community, avoid making those kind of romantic stories that misrepresent how science works um, a, a common story. So the wonderful thing about science is that eventually the truth always comes out, it always prevails. The person with the right idea is eventually proven to be right. There are half a dozen Nobel Prize speeches which start out with them holding up a copy of their paper that got rejected for publication once, twice, three times because no one accepted it. So it's a very romantic story. We've all, everybody in lesser and greater de uh, degrees has faced skepticism uh, when you've come up with new findings. But the whole idea of science is for others to either replicate it or prove that it's wrong and eventually the truth always comes out. That's one of the beauties of science. And perhaps we can hear, I think the same thing is true in physics, just like it is in medicine. Yeah, so your comments can take us. Um, I, I'll just add to that. I, I research creativity. I'm writing on a book, a book about it right now. This mythology that you're talking about is actually not as broad in the whole of human thinking as it's really a romantic era thing that's been particularly useful in the 20th century. But there's virtually no evidence that such a thing actually happens, that, um, that uh, wonderful creativity happens out of, out of thin air. And um, movies are always made about, well, movies are very rarely made about things the way they really are. I mean, that's, why would you go, you know? So, so, um, so there's a big distinction here between when we're talking about narrative fiction and, and documentaries. Documentaries generally are dealing with if, if not answering the question, as Clayton was saying before, maybe there's not a final answer to anything, but you're trying to find out what people think and what they did and why they did it. Um, in narrative fiction, you're just trying to keep people in the movie theater. It's a big difference. Um, but Cold Fusion was a very much, the film was very much a similar thing. Uh, and what I found really interesting about that story is despite mainstream science's overwhelming rejection of cold fusion, there were still many scientists who said, okay, I'm open to it, show me the, show me the results. And so, so there isn't necessarily this tension between uh, the scientist who is on the right track and won't tell anybody, uh, unless it's being done for other reasons, like I'm trying to make a lot of money with it or something. But ultimately, science says, Absolutely, let's hear it. And if you can't deliver the goods, then that's, that's when it ends. Yeah, the truth will out, exactly. Okay, so this is pretty much, I think we'll just stay where we are, but we'll handle this from, from in amongst the panel. The idea is to have a bit of a brainstorming session because we want to go forward from here having started a movement of some kind here in Chicago. Um, so a few, just a couple of points I want to make first. Though tonight we looked at documentary films, 
this is as much about experimental filmmaking and fictional filmmaking. You've seen Gattaca, you've seen 2001, whatever movie you want to um, call to mind. So there's, uh, everything that we say is applicable to any relationship between science and, and film. Um, there's three things that I think that we need to figure out how to do in this city or from this city. How to acknowledge and reward completed films that acknowledge that, that relate to science. This is something that Mimi's already spoken about, which we can start through the idea of giving an award at the Chicago International Film Festival. But there are other ways that that can be done as well. We can do it in the educational environment. We can do it in the filmmaker community, you know, IFP or whatever the different environments are. The other thing is that we need to build a community of scientists and filmmakers who are just talking to each other, even if they're not working on a film. We have to have more discourse or inter interchange between filmmakers and scientists. And then, and I'm kind of backing up from this, so awards first I did, which should come last, really, but, and then this community. But bef in the background of all of this is something that I know some of us at least want to do, which is find a way to establish and grow a fund for the development of sci science film projects in this area. Um, and the Sloan Foundation's already part of part doing this process through what they do at Sundance and a little bit at Tribeca, too, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was in LA last week and met with some folks from England who were telling me, put me in touch with the Wellcome Institute in the United Kingdom, which is spending a lot of money in this area as well, and we should be hitting them up too in a way. Um, but I still think that we need to find a way, given that all of the research going on here, all of the grants, money, and all, uh, the universities that are here, and then there's, there's great film schools and, and filmmaking communities that are here, and this wonderful film festival. We have to figure out a way to support people in this environment to get together and, f and um, start developing films or find scientists to work on films they're already developing or scientists who think that they have a story that's worth telling to find filmmakers that they can work with. So, that's what I think. But what are we going to do? Okay, I knew there would be some people. Well, I know this, that, that LA organization is one thing we have to connect with. Does there have to be some sort of peer review process? I would assume that would come from the Chicago Film Festival. I mean, they've got a, a very uh, robust structure already in place for that sort of thing, yeah. And which is similar to what happens at Sundance. But are you asking if there should be scientists as well as filmmakers on? Yeah on that. I think that's what's implied well, there. Mimi, you would just put a jury together, right? Is that how you do it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that could include scientists. So normally juries are quite diverse and have expertise in the relevant areas. I imagine that's already thought of, yeah. <laughs> I think one idea is to engage some entertainment leaders like Ron Howard and Tom Hanks who are known uh, supporters of science and somehow draw them into this. Tom Hanks' son goes to Northwestern or was a graduate there, and somehow, um, you know, at the top have a movement to uh, kind of push this as well. Um, Something that was already said earlier was kind of about breaking down the barriers between film and science, which have already been seen as kind of separate. And so I think for that, a big key would be in making some alterations to the way science is taught from the elementary school level up. Because as a kid who always grew up knowing that I wanted to work in film, always w knowing I wanted to work in a filmmaker, uh, as a f work as a filmmaker, I always didn't think about science as something that was connected to that at all. I thought about history, I thought about literature, I was like, this is where stories are. And it wasn't until recently with some of the films that have been coming out recently and stories I've been reading that I realized science and the discovery of new ideas is a narrative too. And I think it's not being taught to kids in that way that creates an interest in science as a continuous narrative, so. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was getting at before, that the, the culture's separated and it has to be brought back together. I, I will say because we are a company that's getting known for doing films from the world of science and only those kinds of films, 
that we get inquiries, and um, I remember um, a young man from the University of Texas coming out of a um, science field uh, contacted us and wanted to do an internship with us because what he really wanted to do was <coughs> wed science and film. I had to talk him out of it because it was an unpaid internship is, is what we have. And you know, I said, as a mother, I have to talk to you a little bit about coming from Texas and paying your own way and paying your apartment and everything and your food and then working for us. So yes, it, I think there's interest out there and we've had more than one science major who wants to wed that with film. What they really want to do is make documentaries that have to do with science. So there's interest out there. And I would be willing um, to immediately try to look at ways that we can use our big film program here uh, to connect students who are interested with scientists and science filmmakers mm -hmm. like you guys uh, more formally than we, than we currently do. That would be very helpful, I think, for everybody. Well, that makes me happy because I'm one of your MFA candidates. I know too, you so. are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting an email. I, I can suggest a model uh, that might lead us in the right direction. Uh, we, we have a, a very small scale thing at the University of Chicago that once a year some prizes are awarded to a collaboration between scientists and artists. And, and it's not been filmmakers so far because I guess uh, we don't have a strong department there. But this just brings enthusiasm out of the woodworks. Uh, uh, graduate students uh, love to get in involved, and then they bring their, uh, their, their, their scientific team above them, their advisors, and so forth. My own graduate student won one of these awards just a couple of years ago, and it's, uh, uh, it, 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 it created a lot of enthusiasm throughout the, the group. It really spread. Um, so uh, firstly, centralizing so that people know where to go to. If they hear that in the Chicago area, the, uh, the, Chicago Film Festival is sponsoring a, 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 a workshop for science uh, and, and, and filmmaking, and there's a prize. Um, if you said grant, scientists would just jump at you. <laughs> but it's a good idea. And if there was, I like the idea of having some celebrities attached to it, because I think, and, and um, Michael has a lot, of, long list of celebrities on his on his Rolodex, I think. That we have already kind of started the beginnings of that process, okay. but there's never enough of these folks. Right, yes. right. Mm -hmm. I have a uh, question. I'm, I'm a filmmaker, and I've been de working in virtual reality. So I've been using the technology of science, and that's the one thing I, I, that's kind of missing here that you're talking about, because I think that um, that technology, and, and lots of technologies, that scientists use can be applied to cinema and make a difference in how people react to things. I mean, the fact that we have a country where people don't believe in global warming. I mean, you had to change the name from global warming to climate change because it snowed and people thought, oh, it's you know global warming. I think that putting them in environments like virtual reality and the cave and all these other technical parts of science will help move the, the meter farther faster because people when they when they go into a virtual environment they really get it they really get it and that's a way to teach history and science and math and just so many things books by using that technology so can you guys th talk more about the technology involved in the science and the cinema well i can say that my daughter works in 3d um, to, uh, uh, 3LD in, in New York, and they are using the technology to make holograms and to work on some of this virtual reality. So she was a film and photography major who went in that direction. Um, the rest of us, I don't think, are working in that direction, but yes, technology matters in this. Yeah, uh, it's, it's actually a good point that you raise. One of the reasons that we changed the name of this department from film and video to cinema, art, and science is to remind everybody that every day you go out to make a film, you are using a science, applied science. You can't do anything to make a film without applying science. And, and the problem, yeah, and the film in itself is just a metaphor anyway. Yeah. And, 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 you know, actually that's why um, it's dangerous to actually speak to any technology. Virtual reality, um, uh, 
in 97 when I was at the Banff Centre for the Arts in Canada, we had the original suits and all this kind of stuff, you know, when you had to put on a whole suit to do, to do it. And that stuff's rotting and it's r rusting in the, in the basement of that building now because that type of technology was very momentary. It was really a, a middle stage between two other kinds of technology. So what we like to do in this environment is say, yes, technology's always there. It's always at the heart of what we do. But it's not what we do. It's how we do it. And that's very important. I think my students hear this from me maybe every freaking day. But anyway, um, we, we find that in the education environment, it's too easy to just be focused on the technology. The, techno the cameras or the whatever the technology is becomes the primary element of the process. So in education, we try to back off and focus on story and content and character and, and all of those things. Yeah, but they know they've got the technology. You're holding a, a $50,000 camera in your hand, you know you've got some technology, right? So, um, I think I would like to see people that are neutral targeted. Um, I think maybe it might be easier to get them to take some action rather than someone that is just focused on their beliefs. Um, and I think... Um, one way to do this maybe is to host um, community gatherings, like hosting screenings, um, maybe with Q&A sessions afterwards with either filmmakers and scientists or someone that is well qualified to talk about the subject matter um, and get people involved that way and maybe um, have other types of events, like um, maybe have do some outreach for events for young people, something um, that they might think is fun and they want to get involved with, like a dance or something, um, so yeah. I would suggest uh, C2ST, I mean this is their 100th event, so you guys probably do a lot of that type of stuff already, right? So maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so may, maybe, but you, you, you're not aware of this group, right? The, okay, so maybe that just shows you there's more outreach that needs to be done. Well, I can just say with Head Games that a lot of the people who watch the film will refer to short films they saw on YouTube. You know, uh, there was a thing that we were originally trying to put in the movie and we couldn't, it was too risky legally, which was a short clip off YouTube of, uh, it's a, a thing that little kids were doing called the bull ring or something, where they're bashing heads together like rams um, at a football camp, trying to toughen them up. That was a YouTube video, but we couldn't use it because we couldn't clear the rights for it. So it was kind of peripherally part of the process that we were doing during making that film. But if, if you mean uh, using, as, as media makers, using YouTube to further our work, is that what you? Well, I mean, I, I again, I see a lot more five minute YouTube videos than I see 90 minute films. Yeah. That's a lot more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if the goal is to make, to, 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 to inculcate and grow the love of science, I think filmmakers have to um, recognize and pay attention to shorter, shorter clips, um, which is what students do. I mean, it used to be you could make a longer film and everybody would watch it, and now there's a lot of pressure on filmmakers to make much shorter films. And I think that's indicative of the fact that we consume media in like short bursts. Our attention span has disappeared. Um, and so I think it's really important to try and get people to pay attention in shorter kind of clips, because that's really what's happening now. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer now in, in the five minute clip, and I am not such a, not convinced that it's all about attention span. I think it, it actually also requires something from the teacher. It requires you to figure out exactly what you want to convey, make sure it's 
bloody important and make sure you say it really well. So it's, it's the same task that you get if you're trying to write a short piece, a short article, the conciseness is more challenging than saying it in 20 pages. It's the same thing. If you make a five minute, um, if you make a five minute video clip um, and you can actually say something in it, then you know exactly what you had to say. You built up to it in five minutes and you took down from it, you know, you made some kind of an arc and, um, and, and it has actually taught me a lot. It has, it has, it has honed my message by making myself go in five minute clips. Just to add on to that, one thing I'm really interested in is what I think of as the mosaic, which is, uh, I'm working on a film right now about the children of divorce, so it's actually a project, let's not call it a film. Um, and so some of it is dramatic vignettes and some of it's little pieces of interviews. Everything is being done so that every piece is, is comprehensible on its own. But when put together and sat back from, you see something else. You know that image, that idea of a mosaic, where up close each little piece is a recognizable identity, but stand back and you see something else. And so I think, and I talk to the students about this a lot, I think this is something that we're going to do. And it's not going to be oh, out with long and in short. It's going to be about uh, multiple relationships with different durations and different interrelationships between those different durations. Um, yeah, I'd like to ag I agree with what you're saying and, and Professor Mason. Um, I actually produce scientific content, YouTube, five-minute content, partly because as filmmakers you know that budgetary reasons, I thought, am I going to wait three, four years to get a film out? No, I wanted, my target was to get it out to the mainstream public of all ages. But one of the hurdles uh, I, I do think that science faces is the, the press. Um, they're, it's not that people don't want to learn, but they're frightened. And th what's happening now is there used to be more um, specific scientific journalists that would cover science. And now they've had some budgetary constraints in the media here in Chicago, so you have generalists. So uh, the likelihood that a generalist is going to cover a scientific story is quite small. Even if you have a, a great hook that meet at the learning curve, it's a lot more work for them to get the article out. Um, and then, you know, what's going to draw more readership? A Cubs game or something happened there, the Bears, or something, like you said, a scientific discovery. And we're not quite there yet, but I think um, maybe holding some sort of an educational uh, process for the journalism, for the news, WGN, CBS, all, all, I mean, they've got certain scientific programming, and then they've got this kind of pseudoscience happening where it's sensationalized and... Um, I just think it's just a matter of educating that because you need press. So we can hold film festivals, we can hold conferences, but to get it out in the mainstream, you need to target those mainstream publications that are, that are going to spread the word in addition to the other marketing strategies. So these suggestions have been so helpful and so eclectic that we know there are more, and there is a way to keep sharing them, even though tonight we have to start winding to an end. But um, this is another moment to have your devices out, even if your device is a pen. But a good e uh, email address where you could send um, either things you're thinking about right now that you didn't have time to suggest, or things that may dawn on you tomorrow or later in the week as these ideas keep marinating. Info at c2sd.org, I'm told, is a great place where people... C2ST, sorry, T. Yep, no. um, T is in technology. Sorry, can't trust me. Info at C2ST.org is a great place to send suggestions, questions, and, and maybe s start figuring out ways to build these relationships and communities that we've been talking about all evening. So before, in addition to if we can just thank one more time the panelists um, who, and who all joined us tonight. <laughs> And not just for appearing and giving their time and sharing their experiences, but I hope you really heard how much they stressed that you can't predict in advance who your collaborators are and who's going to want to tell the story that you want to tell, or how to not get impatient with processes, whether they're scientific or artistic, that are going to take a long time and that are painstaking, or how I'm so glad that the whole spirit of the night has not been that there's empirical scientific knowledge and artistic humanistic passion, that passion and knowledge and debate and testing are really happening on all sides of that spectrum, so that you don't feel like you get 
pushed into these false choices, right, of being the, the artistic, humanistic student who doesn't realize until later um, that science is also open to you, that we can take those apart. So I really want to thank everybody for stressing those messages. And to go out on a, on a happy, happy note, again, to recognize C2ST's 100th event tonight, um, we are going to conclude with a drawing that I think Bob can tell you uh, even more about than I can. Just two brief things. Uh, one, if you have not given us uh, your uh, name and email address and you want to be part of the continuing conversation, make sure that you do that before you leave because we're going to have other events and we're going to have other opportunities and we have to know how to reach out to you. So make sure that that happens, number one. And number two, I'm going to pick out uh, from a from a uh, cylinder here, the three winners for uh, the um, a year's free membership to C2ST so that you can come to all of our programs for a year without any charge at all. So here we go. Pardon? Okay. The first uh, winner is Alan Skillman. Hey, all right. Good. The second winner is Aaron Freeman. <laughs> and the final winner is Elizabeth Frank. Okay, good, everyone's still here. So again, thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep talking, and if you have further interest in C2ST, uh, you can join this evening, or you can check us out at c2st.org, and there are ways to uh, sign up online. So thank you very much.